Greetings. My name is Guy Dauncey. This is the show Change the World, where, we, where I like to bring on guests from the Nanaimo region to explore big, bold, visionary ideas and thinking and challenges to some of the issues we have to deal with. And today, my guest is Larry Whaley, who is very active with Island Roots. But as a bit of background, you grew up in Alberta with parents who were involved in the co-op movement. You got the co-op movement in your blood. You helped found a housing cooperative, you know, the Bethune Housing Cooperative, and I'll ask you to explain why Bethune is important <laughs> later. Um, you're a member of a small food co-op. You served for four years on the board of the Mid-Island Co-op. You traveled across Canada helping people with financial issues. And then you thought after Occupy, well, you tell me the story, starting with Occupy and Nanaimo and how that led you into food. I'd, I'd really like to just go back. Go back uh, a further stage. Yeah, okay. yeah I, I think it's um, Your a, parents, a little. Your Alberta. Back to Alberta, yeah. Okay. Actually, um, I grew up in a small town called Hannah in uh, southeastern Alberta. Yes. Um, my grandfather was actually a founder of the Hannah Co-op. Oh. So it goes back even one generation so further. So we're talking 19... 10 kind of period uh, now, 1900? 1915, 20 wow. in, okay, in there. Very early cooperative then, right? Yeah. yeah, it started out there. He was one of the founders and uh, he died before I was actually born. But, yes. but because he was involved and because my parents were uh, members of the co-op and attended the meetings, and yes. not particularly active, but they were, they were there, um, I think it kind of got into my blood. And, so let me put uh, this in context. During the 19th century, the 1800s, we've got the rapid advance of capitalism, the rapid advance of private investors, private companies, private ownership, stuff like that. We've got the Manchester cotton mills we can all visualize. And the co-op movement was really born in the 1860s, 1870s kind of period. Yes. And so obviously the-, the Start, I think it started in England. And Robert uh, Owen was a factory owner who was working as a cotton mill owner rather. And he started thinking the way his staff were, his workers were being treated. He, he helped them found their own food cooperative yeah. in his factory in Scotland. Yeah. And then he went on to actually help form the idea of a, a, a business owned by its workers instead of being owned by the investors or the, the company owners. And we're all yeah. in the employees. Yeah, cooperatives, so, cooperatives basically started out as you know. worker co-ops and, yes. and grew out of that into um, all manner of co-ops. Right. So then the, the the co-op that your parents formed in Alberta was a consumer co-op? Uh, my grandparent, grandparents. My, my grandfather, Sorry, uh, grandfather, was, grandfather was a founder of a consumer cooperative, yes. And a consumer cooperative is what? It's um, a retail operation that's owned by okay. the people of the community. And right. uh, they, were, they were quite common across the yeah. prairies uh, at that time uh, because there wasn't, there wasn't the kind of... of Right. large corporations so you, doing retail that there right. are now. So you can picture three retail stores. One could be privately owned, just we're normal consumers. Yep. The second could be worker owned, yes. right? Yes. And the third could be owned by the consumers, yes. by the people. So yes. that's the kind of one, that's what you're talking about, right? That's, that's uh, where, yeah. where my history comes from, yeah. Right. That's a little bit different than the yeah. one we're working on now. So but the first cooperative that you formed then when you were younger was the housing co-op? Yes. Tell me about that. Uh, Norman Bethune Co-op in, uh, in Burnaby. Yes. Uh, it was uh, basically, um, I had a young family and I needed a place to, uh, to live. Okay. And uh, started looking around. There was a uh, housing shortage, a yes. crisis of housing, much like there is today. Yes. Rents were skyrocketing. This is what, the 1960s? 70s. 70s, okay. And um, so what, uh, basically what happened is uh, there was the first NDP government was elected in British Columbia. Okay. And so we went and had a chat and said, yes. let's get things going. And there was quite a, quite a movement, uh, not just ours. But Did you buy land and build a building? We, we leased the land originally yes. from the provincial government yeah. and, uh, and got a mortgage from Canada Mortgage and Housing. Uh, at that time, it was called Central Mortgage yes. and Housing. Yes, history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we, we got a mortgage and uh, everybody bought shares yes. in the co-op and, uh, and put the mortgage on and had the building right. built. How long did that take? Uh, we had a lot of help from the provincial government yes. on ours, but um, probably took us two and a half years. So 
and how, on a level of scale of naught to 10, how proud do you feel of your role in having made that happen? <laughs> uh, it's something I very rarely think of. Yeah. Uh, of course, it was a, yeah. you know, and I, when I do think about it now, I mean, I was young and inexperienced and- uh, it, We all it, it are was, when we're young. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, you know, it, I think it yes. was quite an accomplishment yeah. for the time. But. And, and you, you named it Norman Bethune. Now, I know who Norman Bethune is, but I want you to explain, because a lot of our viewers may not know who Norman Bethune was. Yeah, well, Norman Bethune was uh, a Canadian, a doctor, uh, a communist, who uh, ended his life in China working with uh, the poor people in China and uh, basically uh, died as a result of, uh, of working without gloves and without right. proper anesthetic. And, and uh, But he, he's yeah. famous and extremely yeah. well known in, uh, well, pretty well known in Eastern Canada. Yeah but also uh, extremely well known in China. He's, right. uh, he was a breakthrough Canadian admired by generations of Canadians right. coming out along well, after Mao. So let's jump right to the present and go back to the Occupy movement in the Naimo and your engagement with that. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, the Occupy yes. took place downtown. Let, let's just uh, assume for a minute that some of our viewers are younger yeah. And may, it may, they may have been at school and not followed it very much. What was Occupy Movement trying to achieve? Uh, that's pretty hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose. It, but. Yeah, it was, a, it was really a mixed bag. Uh, people were just basically upset at um, the, the concentration of wealth. Uh, the rich getting richer and yes. the and lack of jobs and hence the term the 99 percent and the one percent yes right yes well the the 99 percent were represented by people who uh, moved on to uh, Diana Krall Plaza downtown and refused to leave okay and um, th that went on for a fair while yeah. and then uh, at, when it came near the time that it was wrapping up things were winding down there uh, there was a meeting of what they, um, what did they call it, an assembly, yeah. um, and uh, I was, I, ch I chose to go down and sit and listen to what these folks had to say, right. and uh, so did uh, now Councillor uh, Gordon Fuller. Okay. And uh, so one of the things that happened at that particular session was that we went around the around the table, around yeah. the room actually, and said, well, what would you like to do when this is over? Where, yes. where, would, your, where would you like your future to lie? Yeah, good question. And, and after everybody had had their say, uh, Gordon Fuller commented that um, he was surprised at how many of these young people wanted to farm. Right. Um, what happened then is that bells started going off in my head because I was thinking, okay, you're going to farm, but what are you going to do with what you grow? How yes. are you going to make a living yes. if you farm, but there's nowhere to sell your product? Right. So um, that started me thinking about, well, is there a way we can make it so that people who are interested and able and capable yeah. of getting into, getting into farming actually can make a living doing it? Right. And uh, the result of that was... Um, several months of discussions with community people. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them took place at uh, the co-housing uh, building that okay. you had yeah. somebody on from a yes. while back. And um, a lot of discussion went into it and basically the decision was to develop a year-round farmers and artisans market, hmm. a community market if you will, yeah. uh, and uh, to do it as a cooperative. So I'm relatively new to this region. We just, I moved here with my wife three years ago. And so partly through these interviews, I'm getting to learn the history of how things get put together. So in this instance, it goes right back to you and Alberta having the inspiration to an understanding of forming cooperatives, right? I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know really. I mean, yes, my parents were involved it's, it's and an I know that history. And it's an organizational confidence. I mean, I can share it with you. I founded the Victoria Car Share Cooperative myself. Yeah. And it took me two or three years, but I had that confidence and in a, you know, I, we can do this. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, just, I'm just stupid that way. I mean, if it's there, uh, <laughs> if it needs to be done, we just do it. Yes. You know, you don't, you don't waste but, time fooling around. You say, what is the need? Yeah. As my friend David Weston used to say, 
find a need and fill it. Yes, but there's two important points to this in terms of if we were training young people to become organizers, one is that instinctive reaction, like find the need, let's do something about it. But the second is when you come to a solution like forming island routes, you can visualize what it might be. Yes. There may be other things you thought of that you just dismissed because they were vague or woolly or you know, they felt they couldn't work. And then you come across one thing, aha, you go, that we can make happen. Yes. So was the island routes as an organization, did that come first or did the, 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 the covered market come first? Oh, um, island routes market cooperative was so formed. They're the same thing. Yeah. Okay. It, well, it was the cooperative itself was, is, the cooperative is the legal entity. Yes. Uh, and that's called island routes market co-op. Okay. And it was formed for the express purpose of developing a year-round community okay. market so, in Nanaimo. So the vendors are the members of the co-op? Uh, that's, that's interesting because you <laughs> talked about the three types of co-ops. Yes. There could be a workers' co-op, a consumers' co-op, and, and a uh, private membership capitalist uh, thing, not yeah, a co-op, right? Right. <laughs> and um, in our case, uh, it's more than that. It's a combination. It is a uh, producer co-op, it is a consumer co-op, and it is a worker co-op. Oh, wow. All of okay. those groups are represented on our oh, board of directors. Interesting. And, and there will, yeah. I'm sure, be conflicts where people will be saying, my interests are... are hey, life good. would be boring if there weren't some yeah. conflicts along the way. Right. Yes. But, but I think uh, cooperation means working together with everybody yes. that wants to cooperate. So you've, been, you've had the indoor covered market happening in the summer for how many uh, years Outdoor now? in Sorry, the summer. Sorry, outdoor in the summer, <laughs> up in Beben, Beben Park, right? In Beben Park. Beben Park. Uh, my wife, Carolyn Harriet, was actually selling stuff there all last summer. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Good for her. And uh, so tell me and about we the, hope we'll see her back this summer. No, she's, yeah, her, her follow-on partner, Goldie Paquette, will be coming this summer, yes. But the, the same farm down in Yellow Point. Yeah, so great. what's the vision, the, the next stage that you're carrying in your heart? Um, well, we have, we have the outdoor markets in the summertime. They yes. start in May. This year, the first that's, one will be Saturday, May the 13th. Okay, that's like uh, in one month's time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is actually. I hadn't yeah. realized that. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, Saturday, May the 13th will be the first outdoor market at Bebbin Park, and yes. then it'll be the following Wednesday, and every Saturday and every Wednesday uh, from there on. Right. Two days a week. Uh, that's the summertime markets. Yes. In the wintertime, we have an indoor market at Pleasant Valley Hall, oh, okay. and that operates on Wednesdays from 4 to 6 in the afternoon. So there'll be another couple of markets before the before okay. the summer market. The winter market closes down, the summer markets open up. Right. Uh, now, our, our objective is to construct a building at Bebbin Park and the location very close to where the summer markets are yeah. uh, that will be a year-round market. So people will be able to set up their operations and, and function on a year-round basis. Yes. Uh, for example, now we have people who bring and sell frozen meat at our market. Yeah. Uh, they have to lug a freezer in and find a way oh, to plug it in yeah. and take it home at the end of th a three hour market yes. and, and bring it back next week. Yeah. So we want to, we want to end that kind of stuff for yeah. those who want to. Uh, there will still be drop in vendors and vendors yeah. who come weekly, but there will be some who will say, well, yeah. I'd rather leave my freezer here and we want to provide. Yeah. How often, well, there's two big questions come up here, like, A, the construction of the building, the finance, the money, how do you do that? And, and then secondly, would it be a full-time thing or just still part-time in terms of when it's open? Okay. Uh, two questions, as you said. The, the, Take the second, the easy one first. Uh, would, would, it, would it be full? When, when we first open, it will be two days a week, as we're going to have in the summer, but yes. two days a week year-round. Yes. Uh, as soon as we can get it organized, we'll take the next step, which is to make it possible for vendors to bring their product, yes. leave it the... at the market, and so a vendor would come in, say, on, on Tuesday or Wednesday, yeah. uh, leave their product at the end of the day on Thursday, Friday, uh, the, yeah. and maybe Saturday, whatever the days, the uh, cooperative would have staff there that would handle it for them yeah. and would sell it. 
Um, so that the, the, so that you know, part of the problem with with farming is, if you're selling at the market, you can't be growing. You, if you got to grow the stuff you, and you can't be growing and selling at the right. same time, you, you yeah, that's um, actually, yeah. So you can't be doing it 24 hours yeah. a day. So and interesting, when, if you go to Europe and you see these incredible indoor covered markets, right? I mean, the closest we got is the Seattle Pike Street Market, probably maybe Granville Island's a bit like that. But in Europe, and they've been going for hundreds of years. You don't actually see the farmers there. They're different people selling for the suppliers. <coughs> yeah. And we're, they're year round and people flock. They're just such wonderful places to be. Right. Yeah. Our, uh, our focus is uh, local. Yes. And the person that produces it or the person that sells it has to be involved in the production. So you can't wholesale it. There'll be no, no buying yeah. it wholesale and right. retailing okay. it out. You have to be involved. Yeah. It's uh, grow it, bake it, make it, catch it. Wow. But, but you gotta, yeah. you got to be involved in that part of the process so that when yeah. somebody comes in and says, tell me about how you grew these potatoes, you got some authentic. You, the person who's there will know. But that means that the person, if I'm, if I'm a farmer and I want to sell my potatoes through the Bevan Park market, am I paying the person who's in the, the two days a week? Uh, if you're not there yourself, yes. Because it's still a cost. So the farmer's then got to have a staff person who could be on the farm growing, but the, selling the, the stuff. The staff person could be on the farm growing, or the yeah. or because normally when the farmers go to a farmer's market, they're not being paid at all. They're just hoping to get profits from the actual food they sell. Well, yes. If they're if they're an entrepreneur, yes. uh, once you're paying your staff, you're counting out that twelve bucks an hour, fifteen bucks an hour. And that comes off the margins. I mean, the margins are low. Uh, well, you know, and at one of the advantages for, for the producers at a farmer's market is that they actually get the retail price. Um, yes. In, in, if they sell their product uh, to the grocery store, the it's grocery store takes a chunk. That's true, yeah. And there you go. so you, yeah. they avoid that. Yeah. And from that, they can pay their, their staff yeah. or their wages or, or so, whatever. So the building. Yes. That's going to cost a chunk of money. You need to raise. What's how much is it? How much do you think it's going to cost? Uh, we're we're uh, we're in the stage now of uh, just about ready to hire a quantity surveyor to tell us exactly how much it's going to cost. Okay. Have but, you got some ballpark ideas? Yeah, we we think it'll be around 1.2 to 1.6 million dollars. Right. And what's your strategy to finance that? Uh, there are several, yeah. um, several steps or pro processes. Yes. Uh, we're currently talking with the city of Nanaimo about uh, the possibility of people making donations and receiving a tax receipt. Right. Uh, so donations are one, whether they get a tax receipt or not. Donations uh, to the to donations to the cooperative that's building the. Um, and you are a registered charity then as well, are you? We're not a registered okay. charity, or we would need the city to do that. Uh, the, the city, the city can... will own the building okay. and own the property, yes. it does already, and they, can and they control receipts. the product, and so they can issue receipts. Okay, gotcha. Um, no, we haven't got that cleared through the city yet, but okay. we're working on okay. it. Um, the, the second thing is uh, people who want to support the co-op and are interested in cooperative shares can buy shares at $10 a piece, yeah. uh, and if the co-op makes money, they'll get a return on that. Right. Um, the, uh, the third thing is that we're going to various funding organizations and asking them to contribute anywhere from a thousand to yeah. four hundred thousand yeah. uh, dollars. Just recently, the uh, Nanaimo German Club, for example, uh, handed us a thousand dollars to help out. So, there, are, yeah. there are other organizations that will do the same, yeah. and there are individuals. There are probably yeah probably a dozen or 15 individuals who yeah. put in a thousand dollars each already and there well, will be I, I many others a, who will do that. I was at a big climate conference in Duncan recently and there was one speaker, I think Rob Douglas, I think there was talking about island investment and how 90, of all the money that we put into RSPs for our, for our retirement, mm -hmm. all of it's invested somewhere else and, and virtually 100% of our in, re, retirement investments leave the island and benefit someone's economy somewhere else. Yeah. He's saying, if we, if we just get 5% reinvested in the island on projects that can bring, you know, RSP are looking at you know, three, four, five, you're not looking at 20% returns, you're looking at a stable mm -hmm. return. And this could be a kind of project that if, people, if it's RSP worthy, 
through their, the new investment vehicles they're setting up, mm -hmm. then I can see someone like myself, you know, asking the bank, you know, because I, I, I have all my little retirement savings invested ethically, so it would mm -hmm. fit that portfolio. Yes, and, and that brings, to, brings me to another part of the financing that's in the picture. Uh, first, there will be some grants, and yeah. we've, we've, we've currently got outstanding applications for $550,000 worth of grants. Right. Um, in addition to that, and I think of necessity, uh, for, for a number of reasons, yes. we're going to be having a mortgage. So we'll have okay. we'll have a mortgage for a big chunk of the money. Yeah. Now, you know those the producers, the vendors who are there will be there to make money. Obviously, the lower the mortgage, the, the more comfortable you feel. Of course, yeah. Of course, if we could have no mortgage, yes. we would. But yes. but uh, the reality is those vendors are there to make a living, yes. to earn some money yeah. by producing their product. Totally as well. Like everybody else, they need to help pay their way. Yeah. So there will be a charge for the space that they use, yes. and some of that will go to pay monthly payments on the mortgage. And that's got to be, that charge that they pay for selling has got to be on par with other markets, or else they say, well, I can't afford the, the, the Bevan Park market, I'll just go to Duncan or, or the Crow yeah. and Gate, you know, yeah. the Cedar Farmers Market. Yeah, it, it, uh, it needs to be in the ballpark for yeah. sure. You know, it doesn't have to be the lowest. It, uh, yeah. it might even be the highest, maybe it won't. You know? Would you have yeah. some vendors, as in the Cedar Farmers Market, selling tea, coffee, cakes, goodies, oh, and yes. stuff like that? Okay. Oh, yes. We, so, do, we do now, and we don't intend to boot them out. Because what I, what I re some farmers markets, the one in Duncan is a good example, loads of stores, but it's very functional. I feel like you go there, you buy your stuff, you come away. At the Cedar Farmers Market, because it's arranged in a circle with a band and seating in the middle, it's like a mini festival each time you go, and you, yes. you want to hang out and bump in. And I, it's, so if you had a little cafe built into the middle of it, where you're going to bump into friends and hang out and that would make it more of a venue. So instead of being strictly functional, <coughs> got to buy my kale and chard and broccoli and come away. Oh, I'll spend an hour up there. I might meet people. And, and that will happen. It will be a place to socialize. Yes. It will be a place to sit and have a cup of coffee and yeah. chat with your friends if you want. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the building we're going to, the building we use now for our, our winter market, which is in the fall and sometimes in the yes. spring, is overcrowded and we can't accommodate all the vendors. Yes. But that's about 2,500 square feet. Um, the building that we're going to construct at Bebbin Park will be 8,000 square Whoa. feet. Now I'm looking around this building here. I, I can't, it's, how, how many football fields does it, <laughs> what, is it, is it? I don't have a clue. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Too long <laughs> since I've played football. Um, That's a large space though. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. And would it be open, the, open doors at the end and just with the wind blowing through or would it be a closed proper thing like a full building? In, in the winter time those doors will be closed. Yes. Uh, in the summer, they'll be wide open. There'll be outside markets, outside stalls okay. for, for people to, uh, for vendors so to the use. Can the vendors actually bring their trucks in to offload into their booths and stuff like not, that? Not inside, because okay. that would create a serious exhaust problem. Uh, they can bring it up right. to the door. Uh, okay, have a little electric uh, trolleys for going to and fro. Well, a little well, push hand. trolleys, hand trolleys, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just push it along. I mean, we're not we're not in need of yeah. that yeah. much power. Wow. So how many members are there on the board of your, the three levels of the, the farmers? It's uh, vendors. The vendors? Uh, vendors, uh, and the consumers. consumers. And Sorry, and growers. Got, yeah. No, it's workers, vendors, and, right, and okay. uh, how many, consumers. So how many members are there collectively altogether? At the moment, there are about 300. Oh, okay. And people are welcome to go to our website at islandrootsmarket.ca. There is a membership fee. It's buy one or more shares and you're a member. Okay. Uh, so let's just repeat that. So the, the easy way to get involved in this initiative is to become a member of Island Roots Cooperative initially. Right. Um, and so you, you're a member of the co-op. How much is the membership fee to get started? One share, which is $10. $10. So it's an easy one to start with. And then how many people on the board of directors doing this work of making this thing happen? Nine. Okay, that's a good working group. It's, it's uh, sometimes a little overwhelming, but it's, yeah. so, uh, it's interesting. Well, I know I, I've been on boards with, with 12 and it gets too complicated. So we've got two minutes left to wrap up, Larry. Okay. I, I think it's a great initiative 
Are there any things you'd like to tell our viewers about other ways they can get involved, you know, coming to the market or? Oh, by all means, uh, you can come to the Pleasant Valley market until May and yes. then after the 13th of May or on or after the 13th of May, come to Bebbin Park and, and get is it, is involved it, is there. Is it easy to find it in Bebbin Park? Oh yeah, if you, if you know the Bebbin Park Social Center, um, the, the arena, we're right okay. across the parking lot. Right. Uh, from what the, kind of things are on sale in the summer market, what can people expect to find? You can find uh, fresh vegetables, you can find meat, you can find fish, you can find uh, baked goods, you can find any kind of food you want. Okay, great. In, on the Saturday market, the Saturday market was new last year, we're, we're now thinking that because we've changed the hours and whatever, yeah. we're going to try and bring in more uh, crafts people, more artisans and crafts yeah. people. So you'll be able to, similar to what they have at Cedar, okay. you'll be able yeah. to pick up those kinds of things and enjoy the atmosphere. And timetable? Any sense of when you'd like to start getting the bulldozers in the ground? And oh, uh, yes. Uh, they'll be... They'll be uh, well, the date to open is October of 2018. Oh, I see. That's a year, that's October. Right. And so a, a year of construction kind of thing? Six months of construction, oh, okay, which will take place from the spring of, uh, of next year until so the fall. Words, you, and then you, we'll uh, one year's more to do the planning, raise the money, get, raise your membership from 300 to 500. <laughs> yes. Um, get more involvement. And the website is islandroots.ca. Islandrootsmarket. Sorry. CA. Island Roots Market, it'll be on the screen, islandrootsmarket.ca. Right. Well, look, Larry, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for being a community leader and stepping up to make this kind of thing happen. You and others, I know none of us do this stuff alone. No, we don't. But um, if none of us stepped up, nothing would happen. Persistence <laughs> is the key. I've learned that, you know, between us, we have, we worked out 142 years of living experience, right? And one of my sayings is persistence, just persistence. You can then make your mistakes, but you pick yourself up. You're still there. Persistence. Yep. Well, look, thank you for this. This has been um, Change the World. My name's Guy Dauncey. One of my contributions is writing this book called Journey to the Future, A Better World is Possible, which it's a fictional novel set in Vancouver in the year 2032, full of stories like this kind of cooperative and active food growing and stuff like that. If you like this kind of show, tune in next week. If you'd like to be on the show, get in touch. And who knows, maybe I'll be interviewing you in a, in a week or two. Thanks for watching.